director of the honors program and one of the Fulbright advisors for campus. And I really appreciate you uh, taking some time out to learn a little bit more about the Fulbright program today. We are very fortunate to have uh, two great folks here from the Institute for International Education. We have Robert Jackson here, who is the program manager for the US student program. So he works mostly with the uh, outgoing students. And then uh, we have Andy Reese, who is the interim director of outreach and communication of the Department of Scholar and Professional Program. So uh, thank you all for coming. And uh, take it away. Well, well here we are. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Thank you for having invited us here. Yes. Uh, for both of us, it's our first trip to Gainesville, so it's uh, an exciting time for us for lots of reasons. Um, we're going to be doing, as you probably know from the uh, program that's been set up, we're both going to be doing workshops later today about the specifics of our programs. What we really wanted to do, as much as anything now, is to talk to you, to answer your questions. What sort of issues uh, do you have, or what sorts of uh, points of uh, Yes. misunderstanding or whatever that what can we clarify for you because this is kind of a free-for-all opportunity and we want to make sure that we address your interest as opposed to giving you the canned speeches etc that we will give later for which we are both quite celebrated um, so are, are there issues that we can help I represent the fact of the faculty program I've spent uh, I've been at CIS for almost 23 years uh, and I was 18 years a program officer for the uh, Fulbright Scholar Program, working mostly with American scholars, uh, creating programs, continuing programs, closing programs, etc. So I have a lot of experience with that. And Walter? Well, I've been with the U.S. student side of the program for about 23 or 24 years, working exclusively with American students that are going abroad on Fulbrights. Uh, my current responsibility is, is as an academic liaison to the 1,600 colleges and universities. Um, with whom we work, getting them involved in the process, both through their campus Fulbright program advisors and their students. Uh, prior to that, I was a senior program officer for the Middle East and North Africa. I administered grants for American students who were going to countries in those world regions. And as Andy said, what we'd like to know is, what would you like to know? Um, because we want to, to give you the information that's going to be most useful for you. And certainly we've found with the scholar program there's a, a sizable mythology about the scholar program. Uh, one, that if you're not a name chair at Harvard, you can't have a Fulbright program, you, know, you can't have a Fulbright grant. Um, that's not exactly true. How many of us are named, are named scholars or chairs from Harvard? <laughs> oh, this could be a waste of time. Then. <laughs> um, but that's simply not the case. We work with every kind of institution. We give uh, through the core program, which is the original Fulbright program that's two to 12 months. Uh, we give 800 and something grants a year to American scholars. And they represent typically something over 500 institutions. So we're very interested in every kind of institution. Class one universities like Florida, we work with uh, historically black uh, colleges, we work with community colleges, tribal colleges, uh, four-year liberal arts institutions. The idea is to internationalize America and American academia. And you can't do that by, work, by working with only one set of institutions. Uh, we also work with every kind of discipline you can imagine. Uh, and that's another uh, Fulbright myth that Fulbright's only interested in the arts or the social sciences or the humanities. And the people in the social sciences say, oh no, you only work with the heart and applied sciences. And it's always, you know, you like our neighbor better than you like us. We like everybody. We really do. And we are doing a lot of work with what we refer to as heterodox fields, which are those fields that are coming together now that were traditionally thought of as representing a, a series of separate disciplines, but where disciplines are running together because there's an awful lot going on. I talk about, you know, uh, legal ethics. Is that philosophy or is it law? You know, we do a lot with engineering education. Is that education or engineering? Well, you know, it's all both. And there are lots of things that are going on. So we try to always to remain on the leading edge of what's happening in academia. And of course, our programs are redefined every year by the people who apply for them. Exactly. Because they're always thinking of things that nobody else has thought about. They're going places nobody's been. 
And so, you know, we're delighted to work with those kinds of opportunities. And so we work with every field, with everybody we can think of. And so it's much more an issue for us, I think, in general, of trying to get out and make sure that everybody knows that that's the case. There's not a lot of, oh no, you can't be a Fulbright or either as a student or as a scholar for all these long list of reasons. It's mostly, oh, but you can. You just have to ask the questions and you know go through the process. Yeah, I, I think that it's important to remember when you think of the Fulbright program, uh, think of the sponsorship and, and think about the funding trail. Um, the majority of funding for the Fulbright program, both at the scholar and the student level, comes through an annual appropriation from Congress uh, to the Department of State. And as such, Congress is very interested in the Fulbright program representing American society and American institutions. So we are constantly looking for diversity in the program. And when we talk about diversity, we talk about diversity in all of its definitions, not just ethnic diversity. We're looking for field of study diversity. We are looking for US institutional representation and diversity in the types of institutions that are represented. Um, degree levels in the student we're looking to have all degree levels represented. So it really is a program that has very, very few restrictions on what an individual can propose to do or where an individual can propose to go. Places you can't go, typically, are the places where we don't have diplomatic representation. So North Korea, I know this is a crushing blow to all of you, North Korea is not possible. <coughs> uh, we're also not allowed to send you places where there's a chance that you might not come back. Uh, so we don't have an American Scholar Program in Iraq or in Afghanistan, but we do bring Iraqi scholars to the United States. Uh, so there, there are some limitations in terms of country options, but typically the student program I think is a, tends to be a bit more open uh, in terms of the numbers of countries that are represented year to year, but we typically run through about 125 to 140 right. countries a year. Cuba? Not Cuba yet. Since the day I came on board, we have been talking about, oh, Cuba's probably going to be next week. Mm -hmm. That's now 23 years down the road, but I see that Fidel has uh, decided to step down, and, and, but constantly there's this rumor going that, because Fulbright typically is literally one of the very first things that the American government does when it establishes diplomatic relationships, because the idea is that this is a beneficial program for everybody that really doesn't have a political agenda behind it. It's the idea of studying and learning together. That's, what it, that's why it was founded. Uh, and so if Cuba comes on board anytime soon, uh, I think Fulbright will be there probably from the very opening of it. And it's, it's, it's usually a progression of Fulbright type of opportunities when, when countries open up. Very often the, the first component of the Fulbright program when a, when a new country becomes available is you'll see the foreign student program begin. In other words, international students will be coming to U.S. institutions. Then you'll see the, the faculty programs begin in the exchange of faculty. Usually, um, the last program to, to be officially instituted is the U.S. student side of the program just simply um, because they do take a lot more supervision. You do, you do need to have some sort of infrastructures for them It, it really step. depends on the country. It, it, you really have to look at each, each as on a case-by-case -case basis. Yeah, sometimes they run very fast. Uh, I was just uh, talking about the fact that I set up all the programs in the independent republics that came out of the Soviet collapse, and th those were as fast as I could get there. You know, literally, I got there, we made an agreement. As soon as the mm -hmm. competition ended, we were sending scholars there. The student programs did follow several years later, but also, I think it's because, as Walter explains, the supervision issues, et cetera, the security issues, and also with students studying in an institution as opposed to teaching in an institution, that requires a somewhat different set of understandings and agreements. Yes. If there's an advisory of a country, would, would students be allowed to go to a country where there's a, an advisory? From the State Department? From the State Department? Typically not. But Walter, you it, it really depends on, on what level the travel advisory is. Um, there are several different levels in State Department travel advisories. So it really depends on the level of the travel advisory. It could also depend on where they are 
proposing to go in a particular country. Um, so it really varies. Once again, it's, it can be looked at on a very case-by-case -case basis. This, yeah. I was going to say, the scholar program tends to be a little bit less prescriptive in those terms. Uh, and I, I assume the issue is, well, these are adults, etc. You know, we feel somehow more secure in letting them make their their own decisions. However, the State Department certainly has closed programs before. Egypt was a good example just recently. We had a scholar who had literally gotten there with his wife and three children. He was there, I think, for three days and got pulled out. He was very unhappy about that, as you can understand. Uh, but typically, programs close under relatively extreme circumstances. I know that Egypt is kind of unique because the Fulbright Commission in Cairo was getting in touch with the U.S. students who left country uh, and inviting them to return before the travel warning was actually officially lifted by the State Department. In about 50 countries in the world, we have Fulbright commissions, and they are binational, mostly local uh, citizen representation uh, that actually uh, designs and runs the program. In the rest of the countries of the world, it's run through the American Embassy. So Fulbright commissions are typically uh, well, obviously more active in the program than the embassy would necessarily have time to be because they are doing a couple of other things at the same time. Uh, but they also have a lot to do with trying to set the tone of the program and doing things like inviting students and saying, well, this is okay, or bringing scholars back, et cetera. Could you all talk a little bit about the, uh, the Fulbright programs for administrators? <laughs> the Fulbright programs for administrators are handled through CIS. Oh, we have four of them. They're for international education administrators. Now, let me say, first of all, that through the core program that I mentioned earlier, which was the original Fulbright program, there's a great deal that's done in educational administration. So uh, education is a major field there, and there are lots of educational administrators who, who go through the core program, but those are longer grants. And we understand that administrators have minor issues on campus where they might actually be expected to be resident and therefore cannot be away. But there are four international educational administrator programs, they're called the IEAs, and the IEAs are in uh, Germany, Japan, Korea, and the newest one is in India. Uh, and I was able to get a program for community college administrators set in Russia. Uh, so there's another one that doesn't exactly fit in the IEA program, but it's about the same length. These run <coughs> for about two to three weeks. Uh, the application deadlines vary. We have, I think, out front a flyer about them uh, with the deadlines on them. Uh, the largest program in the world is the one in Germany. Uh, it's about 25 international education administrators, but that is a broadly uh, defined group of people. It includes things like alumni relations, student advising, all kinds of things. But people whose major jobs on campus have to do somehow with international stuff. Uh, and uh, the Germans are very interested because one of the things that they have uh, come to understand about uh, educational administration is that in many, in many ways the Americans have written the book on that. Because, you know, we started all these crazy things with alumni relations and this sort of stuff a long, long time ago when many nations were being entirely supported by the national government. And they weren't looking for money, necessarily additional money from outside. Well, now a lot of that's falling apart for various reasons. And people are looking to figure out, well, how do we keep an educational system going? And part of that is by uh, obviously bringing people from overseas, but involving other people in the society who may not traditionally have been a part of educational administration or even thought about it. So they have a very broadly defined program. Uh, it's a wonderful program because what happens is the Americans who apply go to Germany for I think it's two and a half to two and a half to three weeks. Uh, they meet with German counterparts. They meet with the German Ministry of Education. <coughs> They also get a special uh, segment of the time uh, to go out. They're divided up into groups, and they go out and visit German universities. And then they also get a briefing on the whole Bologna process and what's going on in the EU. So it's a, a very broadly construed program and an excellent program that's been around for quite a while, and people are very fond of it. Uh, and that, in, in that case, that's paid for virtually entirely by the German government. Now, the German government uh, is very fond of the Fulbright program, and it's one of the countries that pays for I'm not sure what the percentage is, but maybe 90% of the money. Exactly right, 90%. Yeah. <coughs> I'm so good. 
uh, about 90% of the program is paid for by the German taxpayers and not by American taxpayers. So there's the German program. Japan and Korea are slightly different. They're smaller programs. Uh, Korea this year went up to eight scholars. Japan's about five. Uh, and in both cases, uh, there, is, uh, there needs to be a component of students on your campus from that country for you to be eligible to apply. The idea being uh, that those two programs are not so much to set up new programs with Japan or Korea, but rather to help Americans to understand the educational and cultural environment from which they are deriving students from those countries. Now, interestingly enough, I uh, was learning just the other day about a school in Texas that had at one time had a fairly sizable component of Japanese students, and that component had dwindled significantly. But the school sends a large number of Americans to Japan every year. They applied and were accepted because it was important for their administrators to understand the environment into which they were putting American students as much as it was to understand the, the environment from which they might be deriving off Japanese students. So there are some sort of fudge factors in all of this. But once again, it's meeting with uh, high-level educational administrators, uh, with uh, institutional administrators. And in both those countries, because the programs are smaller, there's no dividing up into groups. So everybody stays together the entire time, and they become a cohort of the unit, etc. cetera. Um, one of my contacts at Penn State has been in both the German and the Japanese programs. And I was almost surprised when she said she liked the Japanese program better. And that was the chief reason, was that they weren't, you know, they got to, the Americans bonded at the same time and stayed together the entire time. And so they also came away with an, an internal set of communications around the United States that they could rely on when they got back. The newest program is India. About two years ago, uh, the Indian government, uh, in part because we were all playing in the sand pile better than we had been for a while, uh, decided that they wanted to, it had always been a sizable program, but they decided that they were going to match the American contribution. And we were contributing at about 80% at the time. And so they now match that program. For the scholar program, the India uh, core program network is something like 80 grants which is a huge program. It's the world's largest now by, by scholar uh, measurements. That's an enormous program. But they also set up an international educational administrators program. That one has only just begun, but they're modeling it chiefly on the German program. Uh, a fairly large group of scholars. I'm not really sure where it's going to wind up in terms of how many people will be going. But once again, because India has an enormous educational uh, structure, uh, and because it's so big, uh, the, the scholars themselves will probably be divided up into subgroups and visit various parts of India and so on and so forth. And of course, there's a lot of interest in the United States at this point in creating programs with India because it is, has become much more prominent in so many ways in education, among other things. And so those are the four programs, and they offer wonderful opportunities. Uh, and one of the great things about them is they're two or three weeks. Germany is the early fall, Japan, Korea are the summer, etc. So it's one of those things where uh, educational administrators can, you know, actually can get away probably because they're not going to be off campus for long periods of time. Any questions? <laughs> Would you mind repeating that? Uh, yes. <laughs> Violently. <laughs> but there are programs that are very much worthwhile looking into. They really are excellent programs. And I, and I can literally say I have never met anybody who was on one of those programs who didn't come back very impressed and very pleased to have taken them. Uh, and one of the nice things I know about the German program is it has included uh, a number of people from uh, black community colleges, four-year liberal arts schools, et cetera, uh, and has really opened the eyes of administrators to, to possibilities. Now, being here at the University of Florida, you're very lucky because there's an extraordinarily supportive culture here. That's not always true. And we find that the International Educational Administrators Program, because a number of university presidents have gone on it, is a wonderful way to sort of open eyes to possibilities and options. And an awful lot has come out of that program for that reason, because that then gets the culture started with, by talking to the right people who were our administrators. Say, that's not a problem here in Florida, and you're very fortunate, because that's not necessarily true. Yes, if a student has a, a, a 
another grant, does Goodnight found, found against that if uh, they have multiple sources of support? It depends on what the multiple sources of support are covering. Um, if they're duplicating benefits, then yes, there, there is an issue. It's effectively known as double dipping. Um, but we very often will work with students who have received grants from a number of sources to try to develop a financial package for them where they can take the best components from each without duplicating any benefits. Is that the same for scholars? Uh, the scholar issue is a little complicated. Um, and, uh, because uh, what's happened over the years is when I first began, uh, I did a lot of certain negotiation because there were people who had, and we encourage people to apply for everything they could possibly apply for. Uh, the biggest issue was typically if it was American government funded. And once again, the issue was, is there duplication of benefits? If both had travel, well, we're not going to give you four round-trip tickets or whatever. You know, you get one, one way or the other. Um, we've never had much of a problem with that. But what I've encountered over the years is that there are more and more programs that just say, look, we don't have time to go through all this stuff. Pick one or the other. You know, take this grant or take that grant, whatever. Now, we don't, uh, you know, for instance, we encourage Fulbrighters in the sciences to apply because National Science Foundation grants, for instance, will buy instrumentalities and things, but we don't. But we also uh, furnish travel money that they don't. And so there are often ways to combine them. Um, my most interesting case was when I was running the program in France and my scholar got a Guggenheim at the same time he had a Fulbright. And the French Commission contacted me and they said, well, we've got to deduct money from this grant. And I said, well, why? I said, well, he's got a Guggenheim. And I said, well, what's a Guggenheim? He said, well, it's a grant. I said, well, I know that. But I said, you know, a Guggenheim is a lump of money. You get to do what you want to with it. And I said, there's no indication that there's any specific duplication of benefits to the Guggenheim. He said, if he wants to buy a convertible, you know, and tool around on the Riviera, then he's got the Guggenheim for that. That's not what Fulbright's about. It's for travel and da 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 and da 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 and it's very specific. And actually, they agreed with me. And lo and behold, he did buy a convertible, uh, which I thought was sort of interesting. Wow. And he had a whale of a good time. But he was also a legitimate scholar who did some really wonderful and very interesting stuff. So it's going to, typically, it's going to go on a, you know, kind of on a case-by-case -case basis. We encourage people to get, if they've got uh, sabbaticals, that's absolutely fine with us. That's not a problem, because we also encourage home institutions to top off what we call top off grants. And that is keep uh, health benefits in place and all those kinds of things. And because most Fulbright grants, unless you're making almost no money, are not going to be replacement salary, we ask that the home institution top off that grant you know, uh, by, well, it can be done a number of ways. But anyway, by keeping the salary level essentially at the same and using whatever the equivalent of the stipend for the Fulbright is, to hire adjunct faculty from the time that the faculty member is actually gone. So there are a number of ways to handle that, but we do encourage multiple sources of income. It's mostly when it comes out of the federal government that it gets complicated, potentially. Is that sufficiently confusing? Excellent, thank you. <laughs> Other questions? Other topics? It's a, very good, it's a very good question. There are several ways I, I would answer it. Uh, 
first of all, always contact the program staff uh, because we list the program staff who work with the programs. And anytime you have specific questions, always ask them. Secondly, because the India program is so new, uh, it's, the road's kind of being built under its feet as it goes along in the sense that they're, they are determining exactly how they want to do it. Now, I read the applications. I was one of the readers for the first two sets of applications. We had a, a hurry up, let's do this really fast request from India that was technically not a Fulbright program, but it sort of was. And then we had the first real competition that, had a, you know, that was set up for a regular deadline. And so I've read for both of those. I think you're going to find, and say this is why I would say ask the program officer, but I think you're going to find that people come from all kinds of backgrounds. I think also one of the things that I found that was most distressing in some of the early applications was that people gave no sense of what the importance to the institution was to this. And I think you can make a very strong case for this is Santa Fe College. You know, it's not Harvard. We have, you know, we're a much smaller school. We have a much different kind of direction to what we do, the kind of people we work with, and how we have to staff. So we typically have not had the opportunity, but we are looking to develop, and these are the people we want to send, and here's why they're skilled, and here's what we're all going to get out of this, and I think you can make a very strong case that way. Uh, were you at Florida, for instance, it would be somewhat different situation, because we were just in their international center, and it's like, wow. Uh, and, you know, and they've got like thousands of doing wonderful things. And so you're from a very different situation. And I think you make a very different case. Uh, and the importance of that case is this is the kind of institution we work with. This is our real life. But this is where we're trying to go with it. And I think that often makes a very strong argument. Because as I say, there were a number of applications that I read from very distinguished people for whom it just seemed like, well, I, you know, it's it's a real good idea. Like we'd really like to do something with India. You know, I'm on like early me, and it, it was that kind of an application. It's like, but you're not making a solid case for what the point of all of this is. I think you can make a very strong one based on the kind of institution. More questions? I think that that Andy made a very good point that uh, that carries throughout all of. Right programs in that um, you really need to both individual applicants for a traditional study or research, for English teaching assistantships, for lecturing, lecturing slash research. Um, you really need to come to the Fulbright program and, and tell us how important it is and, and what sort of effect it's going to have. What is, what is the long term look like? as a result of having had the Fulbright experience. Uh, because everyone that's involved in the review process is going to be looking for that. Um, do you have an understanding of, of how this may play out for your career, whether it's um, professional, academic, artistic? Um, and that's something that sh should be somewhere in, in that formal proposal how this experience is going to have an effect on either the individual, the institution, uh, and, and, and then what is the domino effect? Um, how, how is this going to play out? Um, everyone's looking for some sort of an idea uh, of outcome. Yeah, I would say this is one of the things that makes Fulbright unique. Uh, because certainly when I was applying for grants, it was much more, oh, that's a really cool idea. Here's some money. There was sort of an understanding that something was going to happen because of this chance to conduct research or whatever. But it was that was a, pretty much a minor issue. It was the what's your methodology? You know, what archives do you need? Mm -hmm. All this sort of stuff. Uh, Fulbright always asks for what's the point, and this is the one thing that I think a lot of people, if there's a general mistake that people make, it's that they tend to skip over that. I think as academics, uh, especially because those are the people that I work with, there's a sort of a culture of, well, it's obvious, I mean, for heaven's sake, you know, this kind of thing. It's like, well, it's not obvious necessarily. I mean, it's a great idea, but so what? And Fulbright, because it's publicly derived money from somebody, uh, whether it's a German or from an American or whomever, uh, has this question that's always there, and that is, what is the point of this? Why should we do this? 
this. I mean, whether it's a great idea or not, um, how is anybody going to benefit from this? How are you going to in, uh, benefit as an individual? How is an institution going to benefit? Because there's this underlying issue that has always been there that Fulbright is about public diplomacy. That you become ambassadors for America, that you become ambassadors for American culture and academe, and that there's that additional piece of involvement that's not just here's some money because you've got a great idea, but here's some money because you're going to be going out and having a great idea and you're going to be doing things and hopefully it's going to have an impact on you as well as on the people with whom you are affiliated and associated on a daily basis. And when you come back, what's Florida or Santa Fe or whatever, what are they going to derive from all this? So what's the point when you get back? Well, I'm going to write a book, I'm going to do articles, I'm going to do a conference, I'm going to change the way I teach, I'm going to bring in new pieces, I'm going to help to create an environment on my campus that will continue to encourage these opportunities, it will encourage students. One of the things that I do is I meet with administrators frequently to talk about what's the point of allowing faculty to do this. Well, the whole point is, if you're interested in internationalizing a campus, and if you're interested in creating an environment where students are going to go overseas, or you're going to bring students from overseas, all of those people are going to go away relatively soon. I mean, assuming that they graduate. Some of us are a little slow. But the faculty and the administration are the people who create, support, and continue this culture. They're there for the long haul. They don't disappear every four, three, four, five years, whatever. And so if you don't have that, uh, that culture there, and that's the culture of the bring back, this constant piling up of benefits from having faculty overseas, from creating new points of view in the classroom, et cetera, then you're never going to be successful in having student programs because there's not going to be anybody out there inspiring them. And as IIE has told us on many occasions, between 40 and 70% of students typically will say, well, they applied for programs because a faculty member encouraged them to do so. Exactly. This just doesn't pop into their heads all of a sudden, especially when they're watching, you know, like American Idol and going to like, you know, the mall right. and, you know, texting all the time and this kind of thing. Those are not ideas that are necessarily going to just pop into their heads. They have to have somebody there suggesting it, saying this is a great idea, it has a wonderful impact, benefits, etc. It's going to do you good. So, you know, we there's more to Fulbright than just having a great idea. And I'd say this yeah. is the one point that I think people sometimes miss, and that is what, what are the outcomes? I also, I also think it's often missed in letters that professors write in support of student applications. The benefit to the individual as opposed to the benefit to scholarship. It's really something that, uh, that everyone who's involved in reviewing these applications is looking to get a handle on. Because it's important to remember throughout the Fulbright process that not everyone that reads a particular application is necessarily going to be in that particular field. So the scholarship may not be as obvious to them as to someone who's in, in, the, in that particular field. Um, but they can understand the benefit to the individual for having had the opportunity. So I think that in, in letters that you write for students who may be applying for Fulbright, it's important to remember that there is this aspect that people are going to be looking for. Certainly, with the, the faculty program, uh, I've had to write letters for tenure review uh, on a number of occasions. And uh, typically, when I get the request, it's well, you know, my dean or whatever says that Fulbright is a non-review process. It's like, oh please, <laughs> you know, it's literally everybody in his aunt Louise is going to read a Fulbright application. You're reviewed probably about eight times. It may be the most heavily reviewed scholarship program anywhere, I mean quite literally. And that means it's going to be reviewed within the country by a number of people, by discipline specialists who are specialists in the field you're applying in, uh, by other educated people who may, who typically won't all be in the field that you're in, uh, by diplomats and you know uh, people from the J. William Fulbright Foreign Scholarship Board who have presidentially appointed oversight board for the program, and then it's going to be read overseas. And in a number of those cases, it's a full set of reviews. You know, the, say the French bring in, once again, everybody but Marie Antoinette, 
the, the Dutch have the uh, Dutch Royal Academy of Sciences is present. They're a part of the review process. Uh, individual institutions will then review these. So you're going to get people inside and outside the culture of America. You're going to get people inside and outside your field. Uh, you're going to get people from different kinds of institutions. And that's one of the reasons why we keep telling people what you may think of as being utterly obvious to absolutely anybody is not necessarily right. that the case. And in our program, you've got five pages to explain what you're going to do. It's a five-page project statement. So you have to hit the ground running, and you have to think very carefully about what the points are that you're making and make sure that an educated person can follow it. Exactly. And get an idea of, I understand, whether I understand nuclear physics or not, shall we all raise our hands on that one? Uh, whether I understand nuclear physics or not, I can figure out that you're trying to get from here to there, and then you tell me why that's important, and you tell me what the application is from that option to, to conduct this research or whatever, or teach these classes. Uh, and so that's very important. I often tell students that one of the sins that they can commit in this application process is the sin of omission. Don't leave it out. Don't assume we know it. If there's any question in your mind whether or not we know it, whether or not we appreciate it, get it in there if it just takes one sentence. Get it in there. Don't leave it out. As once again, I tell people as well that that's exactly a problem. I say, you know, as my PhD is in Russian history, and so, you know, like most of you, I can stand on my head and knock out 80 pages without thinking twice about it. Um, and, you know, have a wonderful vocabulary and all that kind of stuff, and understand compound complex sentences. You've got five pages in a Fulbright application. So you have to think, and that's the hardest part, as I say, you've got to think about how to be strategic and how to make points in a sentence. And admittedly, there may be lots of other sentences in your brain behind this idea. You've got to make your case very quickly, very precisely. Uh, and, it's, and it's really hard for academics. I don't know, it may be easier for students. I suspect it probably is. But for scholars, it's a very difficult thing to do because they want to give you all of it. You know, it's like, oh, I've got to explain everything. No, you don't. You've got to give us a precise of exactly what's going on. And it's got to be very clear and very well organized. Since the students only have two pages, two pages. Yes, exactly. it's even more difficult for us to advise them how to do that. And those that are applying for some of the English teaching assistantship options only have one page. Yes. Single spaced in a type that is legible to the human eye. I guess, exactly. <laughs> You've implied uh, that it's so important to have an encouraging faculty uh, regarding students. Uh, you've seen lots and lots of campuses across the country. Uh, we're really proud of the students that, that, that apply for our program. They're really high quality kids. At the campuses where you've seen where they've been really successful for a number of years and they've, uh, they've really had lots of applicants and so on, could, could you share with us uh, what they're doing that, that, that might be of assistance to us? Okay. Um, with faculty, maybe, as well. Okay, there's a, there's a school on the West Coast, a small liberal arts school on the West Coast, which is very successful in the Fulbright program. Very successful. Historically successful. And one of the things that they have instituted is a um, reading session with all their applicants. They get all of their applicants together, and they all read one another's applications, and they critique. Well, obviously, it's on a voluntary basis. Um, but this is something that they have done, that they continue to do. Um, and the students are uh, then present their projects after the critiques, um, and they get a second critique. So it's it's a very much involved, very much involving the whole student applicant body in the process. I would say, yeah. Interestingly enough, there's a school to a state in the state immediately north of Florida. It's not the university of that state, but it's an extremely well-known university there uh, that wanted me to come take over their distinguished scholarship programs. So we had an interesting conversation, and I wanted to see what they did. And the interesting thing is, when they start Fulbright, I'm Fulbright, thank you. When they start freshman orientation, 
they start right then. They say, we want you to think about this. We are going to be going to your professors. We want your professors to be identifying people the whole time you're here. Because by the time it's time for you to apply, we want you to be involved in a culture that's going to get you out of here and make you successful. And they're extremely successful at Fulbright, among other things. They do very, very well. And it's, it's that whole concept, once again, of a culture. It's not an accident. Uh, I, my undergraduate work was at Baylor, and I can still remember to my extraordinary irritation, the only thing I ever saw on the Baylor campus in four years was an option to study German in the summer in Germany. That was the only thing that was ever presented. And all of my stuff, because I was getting double degrees at the time, etc., everything that I did said international, 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 and not one person ever spoke to me about anything international, as though it didn't exist. I never even imagined I could and so I've seen the other end of that kind of a culture where people just apparently assume you're going to figure it out when you don't necessarily. And uh, the thing is, as Walter's pointed out, there are a lot of schools like you know, Kalamazoo College is class A solid gold institution in terms of you have to go overseas, period. That's it. You won't get a degree if you don't go overseas. So there are some schools that are you know, really pushing it. There are other schools that unfortunately tend to rely on, well, somebody will figure it doesn't happen. It's a culture, and it's something that a school has to be devoted to. And as I say, from what we saw this morning, it's very clear that Florida is very much uh, devoted to this concept. And you're you know, extraordinarily fortunate to have that kind of a culture. But you can never back off. You can never assume it's, OK, we've got to start it now. It's just going to go forever, because it does. It doesn't. It doesn't. You really have to plan it out. And as I say, I think one of the best things that I've seen is this tracking system where it starts from day one. You come in for freshman orientation, that's one of the first things you learn about. These are, op these are options, and we're gonna continue, uh, you know, sign up, we'll continue to send you emails, we'll have special seminars, we'll constantly be telling you about these kinds of things. And this is an institution in particular where because of the nature of the, the things that are taught there, uh, there tends to be a gulf between faculty and students. Uh, and that's another issue of the culture of trying to get past that because you need faculty relationships to get the grants for as students. And so once again, that's something else you have to stop and think about. How do you nurture that relationship? I think it's wonderful having the international student and the study abroad units in the same place. Yeah. Um, I think it's a great idea to get your American students and your international students together um, have just social gatherings so that they can get to know one another. Um, pair them up when the American students get involved in the Fulbright process. Hopefully there are some international students here, maybe from that country. Um, so it's, it's just a way of, of continuing, uh, it, it's a way of beginning to explain to them the importance of network um, in the process. I would also, uh, I think Walter's absolutely on the, on the dime on this, uh, because I have certainly seen places where international students tended to be ghettoized. They related to each other, but they didn't relate to anybody else. And there wasn't much effort made to get this mixing going on, um, because uh, Americans are still remarkable are remarkably internally directed, many of us, you know, because as I say, what really counts is, well, what's going on, you know, I mean, what's Lady Gaga doing, for heaven's sake? Uh, you know, I don't know what's going on in Libya, and don't care. Uh, and so, uh, despite all the changes in the world, uh, there are an awful lot of us who don't know very much, and if you can introduce students to one another and get them to mix and so on and so forth, that concept of the other begins to be reduced, and then they stop being an alien and they become somebody interesting. And then you begin to wonder about, gee, I wonder about that culture. And, uh, and I think I agree with Walter, it's extremely important. And I wouldn't stop with the students. I'd, I, I'd involve foreign faculty as well. And that's, a, you know, that's something that we always push with administrators. Is there are a lot of things that administrators can do at the faculty level that are extremely low maintenance and low cost, but they indicate that there's an interest here, you know, we have a mixer in the 
the newspaper or whatever, the faculty uh, alumni magazines, we do articles about you, because they're always looking for stuff to put in, you know, this kind of thing. Uh, this constant push to recognize people. I know there's one school that does a, a really nice thing where when there's a Fulbright Scholar on campus, they give them the foyer of the library to put up photographs, just like you have in the, in the center. And, and that always stimulates, and then they'll usually have a, a moment when they get to do a special lecture based on their photographs and stuff. And so people stop and they say, oh, that's a really interesting picture. What did you do? Well, or, or, there are a lot of things that it's a very low cost that people can do that really continue to keep this current of internationalization going. And so much of that is, is that's what it really depends on, because it is not self -generated. One of the things that, that, that we should stress, um, which, is, which is important, is that neither you nor your students uh, should ever hesitate to get in touch with us. We are, we're, not, uh, we're not sitting in offices um, and, and adverse to getting emails and phone calls from people. Um, I often tell students when I talk to them that um, we have a deal. Uh, students and I have an arrangement. We have a deal. Um, if they weren't applying, I wouldn't have a job. So I'm rather beholden, beholden to them. Um, so one of the things that I think that everyone should leave this room with, with an understanding of is that Fulbright is extremely approachable. Um, all of its program managers are extremely approachable. Um, and that's what we're there for. And truthfully, one of the most enjoyable parts of our job is actually talking to people, talking to students or faculty that are interested and excited about the process. It's one of the things that, that really makes the job fun uh, because we spend an awful lot of our day moving pieces of paper around electronically. Um, and it's really nice to attach a, a person and a voice to, to that application. You know, we have always listed the uh, people who work with each program, with each country, with the programs that they work on their phone numbers and their email addresses. Right. And one of the things that happens that always surprises me is uh, I'm on the road a relatively long <coughs> time. Uh, when I'm on campuses, is, and it, that includes campuses that are very internationalized and very pro-Fulbright, uh, to be asked, well, you know, is it legitimate to contact these people and ask questions? Like, holy cow. You know, absolutely. <laughs> if you, you, know, you don't get extra points necessarily for asking questions. But if you've got a question and don't ask it, the chances that that's going to have a negative impact, are, of course, are much greater than if you do. And I, you know, even though I don't do direct program work anymore, I, I was up this morning, of course, we always get up and work. Uh, I was up answering questions about Hong Kong just this morning, a program that I administered a number of years ago. But that's something that we do all the time. And if I can't answer it, I send it to the person who can. And say, you know, I'm mm -hmm. copying you to so-and-so. She's the program officer. She can give you the help. So yeah, we're very approachable. That's why we put that information out there. That's one reason why we go to campuses, is we want to put, it may be a kind of a scary face, but we want to put a face on the program, and we want you to know somebody who's there. And so we put the cards out on the table, and put the cards up here, and they're there for a reason. It's not just to waste paper. It's to encourage you to talk to us and ask us questions. Because the program, the processes, are really quite straightforward. I've always said that Fulbright was one of the most straightforward things I've ever seen. There aren't secret handshakes, and there aren't things that, you know, oh, oh, you said that word on page three, we all know that disqualifies you. It doesn't work that way. Uh, and frankly, I've found a lot of uh, smaller institutional grants that can be quite bizarre. Uh, but Fulbright is very straightforward. It means exactly what it says. The instructions aren't very complicated. But there are lots of questions, because the devil with Fulbright is always in the details of you know, Hong Kong is not administered the same way Tanzania is. It's exactly. just not, because the programs are designed in country. They're not designed by New York or Washington. They're designed you know, in Dar es Salaam or in uh, Managua or wherever. And so they represent what the country itself has identified as being of interest. And so that's where it gets complicated, because Nicaragua doesn't have the same point of view that France does necessarily, because they're just different places. 
I'd like to say your website is excellent. And it seems to get better and it's inviting. And like you say, it, it tells you, here's you, you can contact this person. It's very and we, easy. And I said, we also do, uh, for us, it started uh, slightly after uh, it did with IIE, but we both do webinars. Mm -hmm. And we archive our webinars. Right. You can get to them, you don't have to participate in them. You can get to them online through our archives. Uh, we started doing them on Wednesdays at 2. Uh, we now do them on Tuesdays and Thursdays as well because of all the programs. Uh, so there are a lot of ways to get information about how the programs work and what you need to do. So it's, it's really not secret stuff. I mean, it's not supposed to be. Well, I can personally attest that you guys have been particularly well for very, very responsive. We're approaching. Are there any final questions? We're just about ready to wrap up here. Okay, well thank you all. No, thank you so much for coming.